morning. I'm going to move this controller so I don't shut the air conditioning off on the snake. My ears is already off. Oh, yes. thanks. Yeah, just because that week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not too bad up here. All right, well. Depression. It can be a, a tough thing to think about, I guess, but you know what? Larry already mentioned the fact that a lot of us, you know, I mean, at various times in your life, you can be depressed about things, I guess. The Bible, the Bible, I don't think you see, you find the word depression anywhere, and it's not really, you know, but there are people that you can tell are dealing with it. Um, so we're going to look at a few this morning. I have some scripture I'm going to read. What I did is because it's kind of, it's a little choppy. It's got to do with each one of the individuals that I want to look at this morning. Uh, at the end, I, the one individual that's maybe one of the best examples, but I didn't want to use him this morning only because uh, I probably would have taken the whole time with just him is Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was a young man when God called him to be a prophet to Israel. And, you know, you can read right the first chapter of, of Jeremiah. He says, wait a minute, I'm, I'm too young. He says, I can't. He says, I can't speak. I can't do all that stuff. And God told me, yes, you can. And I'll give you the strength to do it. But he struggled his whole life. Um, you, can, you can read it in Jeremiah and, then, of course, in Lamentations. You know, but we'll, uh, we'll get to that hopefully at the, at the end. But it, there's... Um, Five passages I want to read. Um, we're going to look at Elijah. We're going to look at Job. We're going to look at uh, David. And we're going to look at Paul. And we're going to look at Asaph, who wrote Psalm 73, and a few others as well. So, um, if you want to try and stay up or stay, keep up with me while I read these, you're more than welcome to turn in your Bibles. But I printed them out for myself so I didn't have to keep shuffling around. But uh, you know, why don't we have a word of prayer first, and then we'll uh, we'll read God's word. And, see what he has to say for us this morning. Father God, I want to thank you again uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the fact that he was willing to, to bear our sin in his own body on the tree. The fact that he washed that sin away in his own blood shed on our behalf. What a wonderful thing the story of salvation is. So I want to ask you uh, your blessing on our time this morning as we open your word. We're thankful for it. And just pray that you would guide our thoughts as we talk about this topic of depression this morning. In Christ's name, amen. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, it says this, But he himself, this is Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. He said, It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Job chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, says this, Let the day perish when I was born. In the night in which it was said there is a man-child conceived, let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let the cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of, di of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let, it not, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day, who are ready to raise up their mourning. Psalm 13. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have lest my enemies say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, in so, <clears throat> excuse me, in so much that we despaired even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, 
that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. And then Psalm 73, verses 1 through 3, it says this, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such that are that are hands of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had nigh well slipped, but I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And the Lord will bless his word, and we'll look at some other passages as well. I want to read, um, well, actually, I think I'll save that for a little bit. Now, the title of this, when Larry asked me to speak, is Depression in the Life of the Believer. So I always have to start off by saying that that's the focus is the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to take care of that business first. You need to understand that you're a sinner. Every single person born in this world is born in sin and shaped in iniquity. I'll probably refer to Psalm 51 a little later when we talk about David, but um, it's just the nature of man. It's just, you know, from the fall and in the Garden of Eden, sin has come upon all creation. And you're sitting here this morning under the sound of my voice, and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to confess your sin and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And then we can talk about depression in the life of the believer. I can't, I can't stress enough how important it is to consider where you are going, you know, when you die. Because we are all going to face death or the rapture. And one way or the other, you need to make a choice. Is it going to be, I'm going to do my own thing? Or is it going to be, I am going to confess my sin and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save me? I hope it's the latter. For homework, you can read Psalm 88. If you want to read, it's probably the most depressing chapter in all of God's Word. One of them. Um, Heman, the Ezraite, wrote it. Um, don't stop at 88, go into 89, because 89 kind of answers 88, but... I'm not going to read all of it. It's just homework. You can read Psalm 88 some on your own time. Um, so what is depression? Okay, I'll give you the clinical answer from the American Psychiatric Association. It says this, depression, in parentheses, is a major depressive disorder, is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. And I want you to listen to that phrase again right here. Negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. What are we focused on today? What's the world focused on today? Self. The self. It's all about me. It's all about the individual. It negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. Fortunately, it's also treatable. Depression causes feelings of sadness and a loss of interest in activities you once enjoyed. It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems, and it can decrease your ability to function at work and at home. There's a whole bunch of symptoms I'm not going to read. You can look those up online. Um, there are medical conditions, clinical depression, that can be treated with medicine. And I'm not, I, you know what, let, let me say this disclaimer right off the bat. I am not here to put down the idea of depression. Depression is a very real thing. And it not only affects the unbeliever, but it can affect the believer as well. So we don't want to say that, you know, I, I know. When I was a little kid, and I, I've heard, you know, you hear conversations with adults, you know, whether here or at home or thinking, you know, oh, Christians should never be depressed. That's not, you know, a Christian doesn't have any reason to be depressed. That's not right, okay? You can be depressed, and we need to talk about why we can be depressed and what we can do about it. Um, but there is medical depression. There is chemical imbalances. You know, and, and again, I want to stress the fact that any, you know, physical problems are all the result of sin. Mm -hmm. Everything in this world, whether it's cancer, a, a common cold, birth defects, all that stuff, it's all a result of sin. Sin came into the world and threw everything out of, out of kilter. So that's an important thing to recall or think about. It says here that depression affects an estimated 1 in 15 adults every given, any given year. That's only 6.7%. And one in six people uh, will experience depression <coughs> sometime in their life. Um, I would posit that, that those numbers are probably really low, um, especially with men, because men won't admit it that they're depressed. Um, the world, the unsaved world, 
has no cure for depression. Now, you know, this definition says it's fortunately it's treatable, it's not treatable. You can take medicine and make yourself feel better. But the unsaved world does not have a cure for depression. Which should give the believer something to be happy about. So the, the believer should be happy about the fact that because we do have a cure for depression. And we'll, we'll start talking about that here. Okay, so, so can a believer suffer from depression? Yes, absolutely. I'm not going to go into my own personal life story, but there has been times in my life where I've struggled with it for a period of time. And if you're really interested, I can share some of that with you later, but I'm not going to take time now. Um, outside of clinical or medical, medical depression, should, should a believer su uh, succumb to depression? Now, again, the clinical and medical, you can have a problem that you need medicine for. I get that. You know, again, I don't want to discount that. So biblically speaking, from what I've been able to tell in the study, there's only one real response that, that's the correct response to depression in the life of the believer. And I'm not going to give it away yet. We'll get to it in a little bit. Now, there's a difference between... Last week, we had split classes, right? And we talked about temptation. Um, temptation does not directly result in depression. Testing, trials and testing can result in depression. Temptation indirectly can result in depression. But temptation, what does James say? Temptation is driven by our own lust. Temptate, right? I know Doug mentioned that last week for the men's class, but temptation comes from within us. We see something we shouldn't look at. We do something we shouldn't do. We go somewhere we shouldn't go. Temptation is our fault. Temptation is weakness. In the, it's the old nature coming through the believer. We can become, you know, if it's a chronic thing and, and we, have, we struggle with a sin, it can become depressive, I suppose. But then there's a problem that we need to take care of before the Lord. Um, but testing is an important thing to consider. Peter talks all about that. You know, he says, don't, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that can come upon you. It's, it's, it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? No, that, that's not true. We should all expect to be tested in life because that's what makes us stronger as a believer. So Elijah, let's look at Elijah. This is in 1 Kings chapters 18, 19, and 20. This is the story I mainly want to look at. 1 Kings chapter 18, 19, and 20. Now we're not going to read all the chapters or we're going to read out of here. But Elijah shows great faith in the Lord in this. It, look at it in 17 verse 1. He says this, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, and said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And there was no rain. We know that for, I think it was three and a half years. That takes a lot of faith, right? He said, there's not going to be any rain. He prayed to God, and there was no rain. God called the rain. So, no rain for three years. Then we have in chapter 18, we have the... the the struggle with the Baals, the prophets of Baal, and there's a great victory, right? I mean, they do all this, all this stuff, right? The prophets of Baal kill their their their, their sacrifice, and they try to, you know, jumping around or cutting themselves and doing all kind of stuff from morning till evening, and nothing happens. And Elijah calls the people to himself. They get their sacrifice ready. They pour water. My dad always liked to say, he says, "It didn't rain for three years. Where did they get the water from?" No, that's my dad. And I'm skeptical too, I suppose. <laughs> Anyways, they took three, you know, I mean, all this water, poured it all over the place, a trench they dug full of water, and Elijah prays to God, and fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, licks up all the water, and the people say, The Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. They take the prophets of Baal down to the, the, the brook Kishan and kill all of them. Great faith in God. And then, he says to Ahab, now it's going to rain, so you better get back to Jezreel. Now from where they were, uh, what mountain was this on? It wasn't Mount Hermon, it was Mount, uh, anyways, it's like 30 miles to Jezreel. 
the hand of God was on Elijah, right? So he tells Ahab to get to Jezreel. He goes in his chariot. Ahab, or Elijah, it says the hand of God was on him. It says he tied up his, 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 his robes and he outran the chariot. Great faith. Great dependence on the power of God. And then we get to chapter, uh, where is it here, 20? 19, Ahab tells Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This is chapter 19, and Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. This is verse 2 of chapter 19. So let the gods do to me, and more so, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. And then what does he do? He runs. He runs away in fear of this woman, Jezebel. She was wicked. She was a conniver, and he knew that. But he had just done these great things in the faith of God, and now he runs. God provides for him. He's, he, he sends him to Mount Horeb. Now, Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai, all the way down to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, a long, long ways away. And he, uh, and he sends him there. You know, I mean, there, there was an interlude where we read where Elijah ran off and he said, you know, kill me because I'm not worth living. I'm no better than my father's. He was tired. You know, he, he was depressed. Why was he depressed? Because he had done this great stuff. And then this woman said, I'm going to kill you. And he, I think Elijah was just tired. He was exhausted. You know, and that's something we have to be aware of in our own lives. Um, we have to be conscious of not only what we're doing for the Lord, but how we're doing it. Okay, you can, you can serve the Lord and try to serve him in, in your own steam, in, in your own way. And sometimes that's not the best way. You can become exhausted doing that because it doesn't respond well. God doesn't honor the, that kind of motivation. God wants us to get ourselves out of the way and let him have control. Now, I'm not saying Elijah was doing things on his own steam. He wasn't, I don't think. But the fact is, is that he was tired. And he, and he is exhausted, and he says, kill me, Lord, I'm not, it's not worth it anymore, I'm done. And an angel appears, and he gives him a little cruise of water, and a little, makes a little cake for him. And in that, the strength of that food, 40 miles, or 40 days and 40 nights, to, to the mountain of God. And, and when we get to that scene on the mountain of God, he's in a cave. And I always wonder if that was, I wonder if it was the same cave where Moses stood, and God put his hand over Moses and declared himself and passed by him. So the glory. I don't know. That's just speculation. But anyways, Elijah's in this cave, and he a wind whips up, and it's a powerful wind. It says it even broke the rocks, but he didn't. God wasn't in the in the storm. And then an earthquake comes, and God wasn't in the earthquake either. And then a gentle breeze blows, and Elijah goes out to the cave. And he wraps himself in his mantle. And he goes out to the mouth of the cave, and he hears. This, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been real zealous for you. This is my paraphrase. You know, he says, and, and, and I've done all this stuff, and, and I'm the only one left. And God tells him what he's going to do. God has a plan. But it's the still small voice, you know. We have to listen for what God has for us. Um, Elijah would go on to, to find Elisha and, and, and anoint him as his, his successor, you know, and then there's Haziel the king, you know, and he did these other guys who were going to turn things around in Israel. They're going to take care of Ahab and his wicked kingdom and they're going to turn things around. God had a plan. And sometimes we have to stop and listen to what God has for us. When we get depressed, when we get down about things, listen. Listen to that still small voice. Elijah had to learn that. <clears throat> And it took a 40 day and 40 night trip to figure it out. But he understood that God had a plan. And when he did that, what did God tell him? He says, there's 7,000. You're not the only one. 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee of Baal or kissed his mouth. He says, you're not alone. And he sent him, and the plan was successful. Elijah was afraid of death, right? At the, I love this, at the hands of Jezebel. Uh, but you know what? Elijah didn't even taste death, did he? God, in his grace and his mercy, took him to heaven in a whirlwind. What an awesome thing. He's all worried about this woman killing him, and then God said, don't worry about it. I got you. And he took him right to heaven. 
You know, God always wants what's best for us, for his children. We just have to let him have his way. We have to get ourselves out of the way and let him have his way with us. All right, let's take a look at Job. Job. I titled this, uh, by the way, Elijah, I titled Despair. Um, Job is testing and correction. I think a lot of times we read the book of Job. Um, Job can be tough. You know, it's difficult to, to get, I think. Um, and I think sometimes we, we look at it the wrong way. But um, because Job was, God says to, you know, well, let's go there and I'll misquote things. I don't want to do that. Right at the beginning, first chapter of Job, you kind of know how it starts, but there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And it talks about all his possessions, his sons and daughters. And then it says in verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, where are you coming from? And Satan said to the Lord, from roaming about in the earth and walking around in it. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Have you considered my, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil? Then Satan answered him, he said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but put forth your hand and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand upon him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. And we won't go into reading further, but we know the story, right? Everything that he had was taken from him. And he says, naked I came into this world, naked I'm going out, you know. He says, shall we not, and he tells his wife too, shall we not receive good and bad from the Lord? He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, it says right there, Job didn't sin in any of that. So why is all this stuff happening to him, right? You get to the second day when the sons of God comes before God and Satan with him, and he says, have you seen Job, even though you incited me against him, that he still maintains his integrity? And Satan says, yeah, skin for skin. He says, touch his flesh and his bone, and he'll curse you your face, right? So the Lord allows him to put boils all over Job, and Job sits in the ash heap with us. Piece of pottery to scrape the, the boils. Awful. That's an awful picture, isn't it? It really is. The point is, is that Job had a problem. Job was a rich man. Job was a righteous man. It says in the first chapter there, in verse 4, it says, His sons used to go and hold a feast at the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So what's wrong with that? There is something wrong with that. What's wrong with it is that Job was banking his son's redemption on his own righteousness. That is why God used Satan to teach Job a lesson. Now we read chapter three or parts of chapter three, and Job become highly depressed. I mean, you can read about the fact that he lamented the day he was born, that he wished uh, he would have been stillborn from his mother's womb. Um, terrible stuff. And yet he maintained, even in his argument with his three friends, he maintained his integrity. He maintained the fact that he was still righteous. That he didn't do anything wrong. Elihu comes along and he was angry with all of them, all four of them, because, you know, the Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought there was a cat or something. <laughs> like a snarl. Uh, you know, his three friends couldn't refute his argument, and he wouldn't relent on the fact that he was okay. And then you get to the later chapters of Job, and God talks to him. And he says, God's first statement to Job says, Who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge? And God goes into all, the whole, all of his creation, 
you know, the, the, the stars and, and all of the universe and then the beasts of the earth and all the, all the things that I, God, put on the earth and control. He says, how are you able to even understand any of this stuff? You know, and, and I love the end of that, of the book of Job, because that is where, um, what's the answer? Um, the believer, I wrote down here, the way the believer must see him or herself before God, empty, with nothing to offer. All right, Job finally says in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, he says this, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak, I will ask you and, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That is the attitude that we have got to have before a holy and righteous God. Job finally came to the realization that he had nothing. All of his self-righteousness accounted for absolutely nothing. It was God. It was all about God. And, and he had to rely only on him. You know, again, I, I always like to quote the, the third verse of Rock of Ages, where it says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless come to thee for grace, foul like to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the idea. That's the idea that Job had learned. Job suffered depression because of his own self-righteousness. Testing and correction. The, the Lord uses testing. Sometimes he even, even in, like in this case, uses Satan to accomplish his, his works and to accomplish the testing that he needs to bring us to the point where we realize that we have nothing without him. And I can't stress enough how important it is to, to come to that realization. Um, God tests us in love. He always, you know, he loved Job. He, he, he wouldn't have said the things to Satan that he said about Job. Everything he said was true. He was upright and blameless. And he ran from evil. But he had a problem with self-righteousness. That God had to work out of him. Um, there might be something in your life that is causing you a problem. Maybe something you don't even know about. It could be something in your family, maybe not even you directly. God will use it to, to show you his love for you and to show you the fact that you need to, to rely on him, whatever that may be. Let's look at David. Now David, if you read his Psalms, you know, David was all over the place. He was up and down a lot. Um, I need. Oh, I did. Psalm 13, you know, it's a great example of that. You know, he, Psalm 51 as well. Um, that was after the incident with Bathsheba and with uh, Uriah the Hittite. So, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. David, the title I put under David is Consequences of Our Actions. There are things that we do, and again, now this can come into, this is where temptation comes in and causes depression. If you go through uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where he has his affair with Bathsheba. Um, the Bible, because it gives us snapshots, you know, it doesn't, we don't know the lead up to that, but I, I will guarantee you you know, David said he was on the roof of the palace and that she was on the roof of her house bathing. I will guarantee you that that wasn't the first time that David saw her. That's why he was up there, I think. Um, that is one of the insidious things with sin. Once we go down that path, it gets harder and harder to stop. And eventually, it led to a, an adulterous relationship and murder to cover it up. Murder of Uriah the Hittite. Again, I don't want to go into all of the, the scriptures, but if you were to look at that point from David's kingdom up to the point of that tryst with Bathsheba, his kingdom was on the rise. Everything was going swimmingly well. 
after that, right, Nathan tells him the story about the rich man that took the little guy's, you know, the poor man's sheep and instead of taking his own and, and David said, that's outrageous, he should be killed. You're that man, David. You're that man. And David repents of his sin and Nathan tells him, God has put your sin away. That's an awesome thing to know, isn't it? When we sin as believers, and we do, we repent of that sin and ask his forgiveness, he puts that sin away. Anyways, I digress. So from that point on, though, David's kingdom was not so good. It wasn't so strong, right? He had, you have the, the incident, the very next incident was with Tamar, which is Absalom's sister, and then, um, I wrote it down here. I always forget his name. Oh, Amnon. Amnon was one of David's sons. I mean, Tamar was his half-sister, and he, he ends up raping her. You know, and there's a whole thing about that. And then Absalom starts to work on overthrowing the kingdom, and you have civil war, right? And, and, and there's all kinds of things that happen. And then Sheba, who's from, from Benjamin, he tries to revolt and tries to take the kingdom from David. So there's consequences to our actions. I think we know that, but I, I think sometimes we don't know that. David thought that he could get away with it. it. Again, the Bible, between chapter 11 of 2 Samuel and chapter 12, where he repents, there was a long period of time. David tried to, you know, he did cover-ups, he did other things that he tried to get around the fact that he had committed adultery and committed murder. But eventually, he had to repent. And you know what? When we sin, sometimes... We try to get away with it. Sometimes we try to hide it. This day and age, you know, especially with, with men, again, the, I know Doug mentioned last week, you know, the struggle that some men have with pornography and things like that. You can get it too easy with the internet. You know, I mean, you can do it in secret. But you know what? Let me tell you something. The secret sins affect this body of Christ and the greater body of Christ, whether you think it does or not. Because it affects you. You are part of it, of the body of Christ. And all of that, whether it's open sin or secret sin, is a problem. And it can become depressing because you know you shouldn't do it and you still don't have the strength to not do it. You do, but you don't tap into that strength. We have the strength in the Holy Spirit that involves us to, to defeat anything. That's why in 1 John, John writes that the regenerate man doesn't sin. Well, the new nature doesn't sin. It can't. But the old nature does. So it's difficult. We allow ourselves to get into temptation and at least a depression. And the only way to defeat that is through repentance. Repentance and... and yeah. Amen indeed. Okay, now the next thing I want to look at then is the what I talked about before, the one thing that I think is kind of the answer to depression in the life of the believer. What it is that we, what is the answer to it? The answer to it is, a, is the word perspective. Perspective. That's the key to defeating depression in our lives. Paul. Paul has the right response. We read that part of, of chapter one. Let's go to, let's go to, uh, Second Corinthians, where was it? Yeah, Second Corinthians chapter one. I'm gonna read it in a minute. Say again. Second Corinthians chapter one. Sorry, Jim. So we had read about the. We read that later on in the chapter, we, at the beginning, about where he despaired of even life itself because of all the troubles they had gotten into um, in, in Greece and that with all the persecution and everything. And that can cause depression. Now, was Paul depressed? I'm sure there was times he was, but Paul had the answer to it. And, and, and this is what we can read here. It says, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, let's start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also 
Our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And he goes on further with that thought, but look at that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so we are able to comfort others, right? Paul's focus, of course his job, was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. But he was able to comfort those who needed to be comforted, even though he was distressed, because he relied on the God of all comfort to give him the strength to do so. Um, for just, verse 5 again, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. You see his perspective. perspective he, he doesn't deny the fact that, that he's oppressed and, and, and depressed and that there's difficulty on all sides, right? But he relies on the God of all comfort because God will see him through all of that. You go down... Um, at the end of that section I read at the beginning, where he says, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, this verse 9, uh, that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So we can't trust in ourselves. That is the source of depression. If we start to trust in ourselves and what we're able to do, we're going to fail. We have to trust in the God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So that's the, that's the perspective we have to have. The fact is that, that God is the God of all comfort, and he is the one who stands by us. Does the believer have depression? Absolutely, at times. And that's the answer, the way we look at things. Look at, look at again, it's Asaph in Psalm 73. The first 14 verses of Psalm 73, he's going down this path of the rich get everything, nothing happens to him. He says, this is... He says, what am I doing all this for? What am I, what am I living a righteous life when I, uh, they, you know, they're fat, they're happy, they, they, you know, they, nothing bad befalls them. And then he gets into verses 15, and he says, I was really in a, in a bad place until I went into the house of the Lord. And then his whole perspective changes when he goes into the house of the Lord. And again, what I want to bring up here is how important it is this is group therapy for depression, friends. Right here. We have got to be together. We have, I was kind of hoping more people would be here. I'm a little depressed about that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there would be kind of thin this morning because of camp, but. Anyways, the fact is, is that we need each other. Right? Brother Aaron is always on this one, right? He's always talking about the fact that we need to, you know, share our problems with each other. Nobody in here is going to judge anybody. We just want to help each other. We really do. I do. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I have no right to judge anybody. You know? I mean, for those kind of things. We get into, you know, living in sin stuff. That's a whole different story. The elders have to get involved in all that stuff. But um, we need each other, right? Asaph said, I, I, I was on the wrong path until I went into the house of my God, into the sanctuary of the Lord. So in conclusion, okay, again, I have Job's response, right? Job had to, to come to the end of himself. He had to realize that he wasn't righteous. That even though he was a good guy, he still was not righteous before a holy and righteous God. And he had to come to the point where he realized that he had to say, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Look at Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. It says, and at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me proclamation might be fully accomplished, that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a great perspective. That's the perspective we need. Are we going to get depressed? Yes. How do we handle it? By looking to him. By looking to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, again, verses 3 and 4. I kind of read that, but 
Again, I'll read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Amen. What a great thing that is. So, I want to read something that by, you know, I like Oswald Chambers. I want to read this. I have time, so. It says, this is a, a little, it's not very long, so one paragraph about taking the initiative against depression. And he refers to 1 Kings chapter 19 to Elijah. And that 1 Kings chapter 19 is where the angel comes in. What does he tell Elijah? He says, rise and eat. Right? He had brought him water and something, to, a little cake. He said, rise and eat. He says, the angel in this passage did not give Elijah a vision or explain scriptures to him or do anything remarkable. He simply told Elijah to do a very ordinary thing. That is to get up and eat. If we were never depressed, we would not be alive. Only material things don't suffer depression, like this podium doesn't suffer depression. If human beings were not capable of depression, we would have no capacity for happiness and exaltation. There are things in life that are designed to depress us. For example, things that are associated with death. Whenever you examine yourself, always take into account your capacity for depression. When the Spirit of God comes to you, he does not give us glorious visions, but he tells us to do the most ordinary things imaginable. Depression tends to turn us away from the everyday things of God's creation. And that's true, isn't it? You get in a state of depression, you're not looking at all the glory of creation or anything else. You're looking at yourself. You're looking inward. You can't look inward. It says, but whenever God steps in, his inspiration is to do the most natural, simple things. Things we would never have imagined God was in, but as we do them, we find him there. The inspiration that comes to us in this way is an initiative against depression. But we must take the first step and do it in the inspiration of God. If, however, we do something simply to overcome our depression, we will only deepen it. But when the Spirit of God leaves us instinctively to do something, the moment we do it, the depression is gone. As soon as we arise and obey, we enter a higher plane of life. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Elijah's perspective changed when he listened and submitted to the Lord. Job's perspective changed when he finally realized that he had no righteousness of his own and acknowledged God as the only righteous one. And also when he prayed for his friend. It says that Job's captivity was changed when he prayed for his friend. David's perspective changed when he repented of his sin and acknowledged that it was God and God alone that he had sinned against. And Asaph's perspective changed when he fellowshiped in the house of the Lord. Paul, through all of his trials, kept the same perspective. God is in control. He is sovereign. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. The last thing I want to read is Lamentations chapter 3. We'll go back to Jeremiah to close things up. Jeremiah chapter, or Lamentations chapter 3. Starting right at verse 1, it says this, I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me he has turned. He has turned his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin as he made old. He has broken my bones. He has builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He has sent me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He has hedged me about. I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set it to me as a mark for his arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter my reins. I was a derision to all people in their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunk with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope are perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul, my soul hath them in remembrance and is humbled in me. Then I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. 
it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke of his youth. And it goes on and on. But the, the, the fact is, is that Jeremiah's perspective changes, did not it? You can see it. Right? All those terrible things that he <coughs> said had happened to him. And then it says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Right? They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, if you ever study this a little bit, you'll find that there are believers out there that think that the Lord Jesus had bouts of depression. I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I always hesitate to say stuff like that because he is God. And um, it's no doubt that the Lord suffered greatly at the hands of, of persecution and everything, but he's God, you know, and what he suffered for us. I mean, those verses that I just read in Jeremiah can be applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I don't want to say that he was depressed. I want to say that he knew from eternity past, as we talked about this morning, what he was going to face. And he still willingly did it for you and for me. He went to a cross and with the body that was prepared by God for him, the body that was whipped and beaten and the crown of thorns placed on his head, nailed to a cross, and then God placed all of your sin and all of my sin upon his own son. What does Romans 8.32 say? It says that God, who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not, along with him, freely give us all things? Do we get depressed? Yeah. You know, read a verse like Romans 8.32. God's going to give us, and already has, in his perspective, given us all things. We, have, we were made to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ. What a great thing to know. So, hopefully that explains a little bit about depression for the Christian and depression, how we deal with it. Perspective, friends, it's the way we look at it. You know, how do we, how do we approach it? We, we have the answers right here. Right here. We spend time in prayer. Ask the Lord. There's nothing wrong with asking why things are the way they are. Because um, you find in God's word that when all of those men and women that asked that question pretty much got an answer. You know, um, he reveals himself in his grace and his mercy. So praise the Lord for who he is. Praise the Lord we can turn to him no matter how difficult things get. And hey, I'll tell you, things are going to get more difficult for the believers as time goes on. Um, politically and everything else, you know, things are going to get tough. So, Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the fact that um, even though we may suffer depression, we can turn to you. Um, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Almighty God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, indwelling each and every one of us that knows Jesus as Savior. Um, and even though we can still get depressed, we can turn to you. Help us to have that perspective. The perspective that Paul had that no matter what happens, that God is standing beside us. That he is there to support us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. So thank you for our time this morning. We just ask your blessing again on all the folks that are down at camp. All the campers, we just thank you for them. We just uh, ask that you would part us with your blessing. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah.